be salt. We want to be that city that leads people to the truth. We surrender the meeting to you, Holy Spirit. We're really anxious to hear from heaven. We thank you for revelations. We thank you for inspiring us with prophetic words, other languages, interpreting of those languages, gifts of healings, Lord, that mean so much to so many. We're asking you to be not just resident, not just here, Lord, but president of this assembly. Have your way, Holy Spirit, in the meeting. Let us rejoice with joy unspeakable in our own language and full of rejoicing. We, we give you the glory in advance for lives are going to be changed, for things we're going to see that we've never seen, ideas that have never crossed our mind, a new attitude toward ourselves we never considered. Thank you, the entrance of your word brings light. Let it flood the place today. Thanks for those who are here, others who might still be on the way, still others who might come like the person Wednesday, very late in the service, and still receive something from heaven. We give you the glory for everything you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have a seat. Solomon's got the scripture reading there in your bulletin. If you did not get a bulletin, there's some on the table in the foyer. Please get one. Should keep you up to date with things. I just looked for it, came out on the platform. And you know what? Those two new books, Solomon has been able to uh, target adverts to particular areas around the world. And I just looked this morning, and I'm, I'm moving towards 700 downloads of that book, Miracle Money, within less than a month. And his are going. He's, I think, looking toward 400, something like that. So it's just unbelievable. And you, you check them out. You, uh, Indonesia, India, Kenya, Botswana, Gambia, all these places all over the world. And a lot of uh, people in California are downloading those books for some reason. And uh, there's another place that slips my mind. But I just want to thank you for being here, for praying, for supporting the ministry, because it costs a bit of money to, to take out the adverts. And Solomon prays about where, when, and how much. But uh, if we didn't have that, we couldn't reach out like that. So think about people 10,000 miles away that are being changed. And you'll, you probably won't know about it till you see them in person in heaven. But they'll be giving you a Charlie, right? They'll run up to you. <laughs> I've been looking for you. And you'll say, who are you? Why are you looking for me? And they'll let you know what a blessing you were. Amen. Good to be part of something that's bigger than you. Amen. Thank God for the technology. God knows how to get her done. It all started with my mom being in Northgate Mall, seeing this little store, something about being online. She thought that sounded interesting. Wow. <laughs> Back in the early 90s. Wow. They were the days. We sure lived through it. An amazing transition time. Man, we're blessed. <clears throat> Let's start with Micah today in chapter 6. Read the first eight verses of Micah. Micah 6. Listen now <clears throat> to what Yahweh says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains. And let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear you mountains, Yahweh's indictment, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For Yahweh has a case against his people, and he will contend with Israel. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. For I brought you up out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage. I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. My people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, devised, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of Yahweh? How shall I come before Yahweh and bow myself before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old, Will Yahweh be pleased with thousands of rams, with tens of thousands of rivers of oil? 
Shall I give my firstborn for my disobedience, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O man, what is good. What does Yahweh require of you but to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And our second reading is Psalm 15. A psalm by David. Yahweh, who shall dwell in your sanctuary? Who shall live on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart. He who doesn't slander with his tongue, nor does evil to his friend, nor casts slurs against his fellow man, in whose eyes a vile man is despised, but who honors those who fear Yahweh. He who keeps an oath even when it hurts and doesn't change. He who doesn't lend out his money for usury, nor take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be shaken. Hallelujah. Wow. Amen. Amen. 1 Corinthians is our next reading, chapter 1. It's almost like he cares about our conduct, isn't it? 1 Corinthians 1, we'll read from 18 through 31. Paul says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are dying, but to us, the ones who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. I will bring the discernment of the discerning to nothing. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Hasn't God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For seeing that in the wisdom of God, the word through the world through its wisdom didn't know God. It was God's good pleasure through the foolishness of the preaching to save those who believe. For Jews ask for signs, Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Greeks. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brothers, that not many are wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God chose the foolish things of the world that he might put to shame those who are wise. God chose the weak things of the world, that he might put to shame the things that are strong. God chose the lowly things of the world, and the things that are despised, and the things that don't exist, that he might bring to nothing the things that exist, that no flesh should boast before God. Because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who was made to us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that, as it is written, he who boasts, let him boast in the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. All you, Jesus. And our final reading is from the Gospel of Matthew today, chapter 5. Read the Beatitudes, verses 1 through 12. Matthew 5. Seeing the multitudes, he went up onto the mountain. When he had sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. 
Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people reproach you, persecute you, and say all kinds of evils against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Amen. Hallelujah. Hello, hello, hello. Is everybody happy? <clears throat> Praise the Lord Jesus. Good to be alive and well. Amen. I was talking to my hay man yesterday. Hopefully he'll get over there between the raindrops. And he's got, sadly, he's got a bunch of different things wrong. I think he's 82. And uh, I said, uh, Walter, he said, yeah. He said, Who's this? I said, Pastor Joe, Pastor Joe, good to hear your voice. And uh, he said, how are you doing? I said, I'm on the right side of the grass. How are you doing? He stopped dead, you know, and he said, hey, I like that, that's good. Bless his heart, he gets um, cancer treatments. He has some kind of cancer of the blood. And then he gets, uh, he said, Monday, I see the doctor again. He said, I get steroids. Boy, that's good stuff. I said, is it? Yeah, you feel like you could lick your weight in wildcats. You know, he said, I don't think it's good for you, but it sure makes you feel good. <laughs> I said, yeah, that's, that's, that's good. As long as it keeps you driving the truck and bringing the hay, you're all right, man. I said, you're, you're on the A team. You've got to keep going. Yeah, he's got a bum shoulder, and he's still throwing hay around. He's, he's a wonderful guy. We've known Most him Most people years. that produce hay, they want to give you a ton. Yeah. You know, a ton at a time. Yeah, we don't we have room for a ton it. of hay. He brings us 10 bales. Yep. Right, regular as rain. He's, Anytime we get low, he brings them over. He's good Never man. let us run out. It's a different generation of work ethic, isn't it? For sure. Yeah. Man, yeah. Yeah. He told me he's Can't afraid to stop. It. You know, he didn't know what will happen if he stops. <laughs> Started but, when he was like 13, getting up at yeah, 6, six in the sure. morning and just yeah. been doing it since, it's in him. since then. And wow. it's just a hobby. Just a hobby. He's actually like in a form of construction, but he's been doing Chucky it for nothing. years. And I think he said uh, he's got 140 customers. Can you imagine? And it's just like a revolving door. He's always sending hay somewhere, you know. He usually has help, but not always. So he's good. I don't know why I'm talking about Walter today, but God bless him. <laughs> Ten times, right? We'll pretend like we're in ancient Israel. The song leader would say something, and the people would respond. We'll do it ten times. We're not speaking Hebrew today, but we're praising God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. I hope this is your testimony today. Pretty simple, but it's good. After the first song, maybe. Yeah. Sorry, that's the wrong one. All right. 
right. My bad. <laughs> I thought the other one was first. I thought that was uh, I thought that was a little okay, slow. Okay, let's try this again. <laughs> we, could, we could adjust. There's a river of life flowing down to me. Makes the lane to walk and the blind to see. Opens prison doors, sets the captives free. Well, there's a river of life flowing down through me. There's a river of life flowing down through me. Makes the lane to walk and the blind to see. Opens prison doors, sets the captives free. There's a river of life flowing down through me. Spring up a well down in my soul. Spring up a well and make me whole. Spring up a well and give to me. Sets the captives free. Well, there's a river of life flowing down through me. Spring up a well down in my soul. Spring up a well and make me whole. Spring up a well and give to me. Thank the Lord for that <clears throat> scripture that Solomon read. Mm. I guess it was in Corinthians about God, how God's chosen the things Amen. that were nothing yep. to make ashamed the things that seemed to be something Amen. because I was nothing. I have it on good authority. Somebody really important once told me when I was little that I was a skinny gray little nothing. <laughs> and I was. <laughs> I got made fun of all through grade school because I had such a runny nose all the time and, and uh, I was a loser in high school, but God didn't think I was a loser. Amen. He chose yeah, me to right. be his that's and right. he wants you too. He Amen. wants you to be his Lovely too. Lord. Amen. Good Lovely. work. Praise the Lord Jesus. Never thought I'd have made it this long. Hallelujah. <laughs> yes, ma'am. You're in. Uh huh. Uh huh. I just want to pray for people.
people, because now I'm just here a lot of people die half the time. Yeah. This went to bed and never woke up. Yeah. I'm just wondering what happens in that moment. Yeah. What's the conversation? Do they come? With God. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just trying to feel for them. Yes. So they're not taking it, you know. Right. It's all so difficult. That was a boat accident? No. No? Heart attack. Heart attack. I thought you said they were going somewhere. No, that's my uncle. Oh, okay. They're gone. Yeah. You, you know what? Um, you know what, Erica? I've said this before, I think recently, but this must be God. I had a back and forth with one of our friends in the ministry and a brother had died uh, and he had been a pretty well-known drug addict. She wondered what was up with him because he had made a profession of faith at some point, but couldn't seem to kind of stay on the right track. She asked that question you're mentioning. What, is it possible during their final moments or, you know, Here's the one we want to think about. I mean, you don't want to preach this to someone and give them like a false hope, but, but I think it's a balance here. Uh, read the, the uh, story of Jonah very carefully. Read it very carefully. And you find out when he was thrown off the ship, it says he prayed from the belly of the fish, right? But it also says his own words, I prayed from Sheol. Okay, Sheol is the underworld of departed spirits. So he did not just pray from inside the fish, he prayed from the other side of life. And uh, you're absolutely right. We don't know what happens in those last minutes. We don't know what God can bring to people's minds. Um, we don't know, how long does it take to say, save me? And I'm sure you all have read about near-death experiences, you know. I didn't need to say anything, thank God. But. Uh, just think about that. I think that's God telling you that, Erica. Yeah, I really do. And we'll pray for the the the, the families. Yeah. Like in prayer, sure. too, his brother has passed away oh. Thursday night. They found him cardiac arrest. Oh. oh. I never met him, did I? I don't think he's. I don't child. think so. Either. This was the oldest friend of me. The oldest, and Mike is the second. Okay, so he's older brother. Oh. Yeah, let's pray for these folks' families. Amen. We're just looking to you, Father, and it's times like this that what we believe really does matter. What your word says really can make a difference. We thank you that we don't know what happens in the last seconds of life. We literally don't know what happens when someone is reported brain dead or unconscious. We thank you, Father, that we don't know. We pray for people that are still on this side of the grass who are in a quandary who are wondering, give them Lord the peace, the peace of mind, the thought that shall not the judge of all the earth do right. Are you not a just and holy God? Are you not more willing to save than you are to condemn? We pray in the wonderful name of Jesus, you'll let this window of hope swing wide open for anyone and everyone who has lost someone recently, especially unexpectedly, perhaps through the night season or through some sort of accident, something they weren't expecting. We pray, Master, that this, this little tidbit from the old covenant will maybe come alive in people's minds. They'll think about Jonah, who not only prayed from a bad place, but he prayed from the other side, and he was heard. He was heard and returned to ministry. Others, we believe, Lord, can be returned to a new life. We thank you for what you can do for us. We thank you for a land of new beginnings for anyone who desires it. Bless our time of worship, Lord. Bless these folks. Send your children around about them to be your hand extended in your voice in their time of need. Thank you for this blessed possibility of all that we don't know in Jesus' wonderful name. Hallelujah. Where'd that river come from? Here it is. Oh, it's scary, baby.
say there are doors that have not yet been opened to you. You've tried turning the knob. You've used both hands. You've used the foot. You've used every key in your key fob. None of them has worked. My times are in your hands, says the Lord. I'm the one that controls your destiny. I'm the one that controls the doors that are either open or closed to you. You are walking my path and not yours. You belong to me and not yourself or the enemy. You are not the servant of man in terms of jumping when they say jump. You are in servitude to me. You are my love slave. And I have the situation well in hand. When the time is right, you will not have to strive. You will not have to pound. You will not have to ring the bell again and again and again. You will not have to use a screwdriver to try to prise the door open, but it will open of its own accord. Even as I said in the last book of my word, behold, I have set before you an open door. Wait, says the Lord, wait on the Lord. For my timing is perfect and yours is not. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You're Bless awesome. Your you are awesome. You, Praise your holy name. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah.
Praise your name, Jesus. Praise your wonderful name, Master. Hallelujah. Repels them. They see what you're coming with. They see your light. Don't be upset. Don't be worried. It's what they can't handle. And the Lord is making a way for all to come to him. Don't worry about your light. It's never going to go out. It's never going to stop shining. For the Lord put it in you because he knows what you're going to do with it. He's already designed a place where you're going to be, where you're going to stand, and who's going to need that light. So don't be worried when you're shunned or pushed away or not heard from because those that need it will come to you. They will hear it and they will feel it and they will find the power of God is also within them. It was waiting to be unlocked. It was waiting to be unleashed by the words that you put within them. Thank you, Lord. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. For those watching who think, I don't know what they're on about, I don't get it, and you don't care, and there are those watching that think, I don't know what they're on about, I don't get it, and you want to get it. Well, if you want to get it, that's a sure sign that you will. Amen. God will make a way for Amen. you. Don't give up.
Thank you for protecting us, Lord. Thank you for seeing what we don't see and knowing what we don't know. Thank you for searching out the road ahead of us. Thank you for traveling with us. Thanks for always following after, closing the door on the previous chapter of our lives. Thanks for opening the next chapter. Thanks, Lord, for crossing the T's and dotting the I's for us. Thank you in the wonderful name of Jesus for who you are, what you've done, and what you're doing. Let our lives be still in your presence. Let us hear and let us obey. The Lord says, if you want that help, reach out your hands to me right now, and I will help you. Let's just surrender again today, just by an act of our will, just lift up the hands that are droopy, strengthen the feeble knees. Let's just believe in a second wind. God is the God of a second wind, a new beginning, a new grace, hallelujah, a new anointing, a new appointing, a new equipping, a new enabling, something we haven't experienced yet that we can't even imagine we can't even figure it out or pretend yet because we've never experienced it. But we thank you that it's coming. God might not be early, but he's never late. We believe, Lord, that we receive the answer that we desperately need in every area of our life circumstance. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. You can have a seat. Thanks for coming out, sharing your morning with us. We appreciate it. I know the Lord does. He likes to see the children together. Watched the show last night about people that were trying to hold Christmas in May to help the previous house. to help somebody that doesn't deserve it. Someone's already sold the house, let them come back and have a party. What do you think God thinks, amen? He's awesome, isn't he? Ways, Ways are past finding out. I like just had a full meal, but you kill it tonight. Just think, think of all the believers that don't believe the Lord works in this way. <clears throat> they missed out on the prophetic words. They missed out on quite a bit today because they just been taught the wrong thing. How sad that is. If you have a bulletin, please uh, make sure you read it before you leave or when you get home. Uh, again, the downloads are going berserk. I'm, I'm pushing on 700, towards 700, and this new little book of mine, Miracle Money. There's still some hard copies out there. It's a free download from our website. It's also on Amazon Kindle and paperback. If you or someone you know buys one that way, that's a blessing to us. Church gets a little bit of a royalty. We don't take those, but the church gets those. And it helps a little bit once in a while. Coffee money, burger money uh, for some of our folks. And yeah, this visitor was blessed Wednesday night. I, I kind of mentioned that as we sh move along in our, in our uh, message today. Very nice. Uh, she came via Google. She was, I think she's a caregiver. I believe that's her, her work. And she was on her way somewhere else and just Googled, is there a church open on Wednesday night? And it she, she found it. Solomon had us there, and she found it. It said, uh, closing soon, you know, because I think we're done at 8.30 in his mind. He writes that down. So she came in here for about two-thirds of it and then came for prayer, which I thought was pretty neat for a total stranger. She felt real comfortable here. So thank God we're, we're here. Amen. Pennies for Heaven's out there. Uh, giveaway, takeaway. I just added two bottles of vitamins out there that were the wrong kind for me, but they may be just right for you couple of directories still left. If you're listed in there, please take one. Um, sadly, that's two weeks in a row now. Of course, we had virtually no one here last week, but we're only at about a third of our budget uh, as of uh, this week. That's kind of two weeks in a row. So God talks to you about support. That would be great. We do have baskets here, one in the hallway. And you know what? People are still using Givelify and uh, PayPal, which is great. And actually just had one of our dear friends uh, who lives up north in Ohio just regularly sews through Givelify last week of the month, every, every month. And a little, little note, you know, I, God bless you and we miss you and tell the folks we love them and so on. So 
Nice to be loved, isn't it? Let's look at 1 John this morning, chapter 3, if you have your Bible with you. The first letter, first epistle of John to not a church in particular, but to the early congregations. And it was likely moved from church to church to church because not only was he an apostle, obviously a prophet, a teacher, and an evangelist, but he was also, he calls himself an elder. That is to say, a bishop or pastor, three words, same office. And among other things that he did, he was pastor of a local church or two during his ministry. So he's writing to other pastors as well as other people in the ministry and lay people all over the, uh, the Bible lands. First John chapter 3, we're looking today at verse 24. You're probably trying to figure out what on earth is he on about, down, up, and out. What is this, a ball game? What's, what's happening? First Peter 3 Verse 24, I do those for Jeff. He likes my provocative titles. First, because <laughs> he has to put them on the radio, make them sound halfway decent. First John 3, verse 24. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abides in us by the spirit which he has given us. I feel like the Lord is leading me to write another book. And <laughs> that's was not on my agenda. I actually had a back burner, a book on divorce, which I will get to, uh, but I, I have a feeling he wants me to write another book, which we'll talk a little bit about on Wednesday night. And uh, I was praying about it, and as I was praying, I actually saw the book cover. That makes it easy, doesn't it? All I have to do is just relate what I see to Solomon. He grows another head, puts another hat on, and he's, he works it out, you know? I think the, the, the cover he dreamed up for uh, kind of helped him a little bit with ideas, but he put it together for my little book, Miracle Money. It seems to be attractive to people, which is great, pushing towards, uh, towards uh, 700. And guess what, by the way? Our school registration numbers, we're working toward 23,000. We're already almost 300 registrations in in January. So I'm guessing we're going to go over 23,000 by December. I think that's good news. So it's just kind of exploding all over the place. Everything we do, God's just blessing it. And uh, sadly, so many of our folks are upstairs and others just quit attending church. I hope they didn't lose out with God altogether. But isn't it nice to be here, to see one another, to hear what God's doing, and to have uh, the blessing of God on our lives? You can't get those prophetic words at the grocery store, can you? You can't get a revelation or a prophetic word at Kroger. Uh, just high prices. Okay. So, and higher and higher, yeah. And so this book has stimulated me to look at a number of different scriptures, and this is one of them. Uh, I'm going to be, the book, I think, is going to be called You New, and we'll trust we'll get it out this year, maybe. All right. First of all, I want you to look at the scripture with me very carefully. It's simple, but it's profound, like most places in God's Word. We want to look, first of all, at this concept of doing and being. Doing versus being or spiritual cause and effect. Here's my paraphrase of our text. And the one continually keeping his commandments in him is abiding. And he, he in him. This is beautiful. John wrote this in such a way that he's making it emphatic that not only do we abide in the Lord if we're Christians, believers, but he he, he actually uses the pronoun that he didn't need it, aftos. He, God, is abiding in us. It's almost like he couldn't believe it. Do you ever feel that way? When you read something that God says about you and about your relationship with him and his to you, do you ever kind of feel like that? It's like, what? And you go back and you maybe look at it in another translation because it's just too good to be true. I think that's kind of how John was. He was a geezer. He was well and truly in geezerville, probably right around 100 when he wrote this letter, and he's still jazzed about the relationship he has with the Lord. Aren't you? Yeah. This is the effect or proof of our relationship with the Son of God, that he's abiding in us and we're abiding in him. Now, the, the scripture says this person, you, me, any true believer, is in the habit of of keeping God's New Testament commandments. The word here, keeping, translates tereo, which means to watch over or to guard. It also means to observe like you would a holiday. 
How many of you know people that, that worked for months before Christmas because they wanted to observe Christmas? They had to buy this for that one and that for the other person. And what are we going to eat? And how long is it going to take? And this, that, and the other. This is what he's on about here. We, we who know God, really know him, make a habit of watching over, guarding carefully and observing like you would a holiday, God's commandments. In other words, it's a lifestyle. It's not just a, a one-off. It's not just a one-off deal. Someone took me fishing once. Once. That was it. You, you ever been fishing? Yep. I was. What would you think of it? Not much. <laughs> I came out of the womb lazy. And I've been lazy ever since. And that's pretty lazy, sitting on a boat, <laughs> waiting for a fish that isn't what it cracked up to be and won't bite. But this is not talking about that. This is something we talk about doing all the time. And watch this. According to the apostle, this means not only are we remaining in God and proving it by keeping his commandments on a regular basis, but he, as I said, is residing in us. And it was so important to John that he inserted another personal pronoun, he, of tos, for emphasis so that you and I would get it. I don't know about you, but when I read this, the statement begs the questions, what are God's commandments? What are these commandments that a real believer is making part of his lifestyle on a regular basis? Well, you know what? There's only one way to find out. Pay your money, take your choice. No, that is not a good way to live spiritually. The answer to that question, what are God's New Testament commandments that you and I and every believer are supposed to be keeping carefully and observing on a regular basis? It all depends on which church you attend or to which denomination you belong or what faith group you are associated with. I'll never forget, longest day I live, I was looking into various denominations to maybe get affiliated with to do my ministry as an evangelist and so on at that time, also missions. And I remember I went and met with a big shot in one of the larger full gospel denominations. And uh, he explained what they believed in the doctrine and so on. It wasn't very long. And then he explained some of the commitments. The doctrine sheet was this long. The commitments, it was like toilet paper. You could just keep rolling and rolling. And I mean what you could eat, what you could do, what you could watch, where you could go to the movie or not. Could you, could you swim if there are women present? If you're a man, can you swim if you're a man and there's women? Or the reverse. I thought, what on earth? You've added on more than the doctrines. And I guess to them, you, you don't cross those T's, dot those I's. You don't have long sleeves, long hair, and long face. You don't belong. So guess what? I bid them adieu. And we didn't fill, affiliate with them. You and I don't need to wonder about what these commandments are that we're keeping on a regular basis, proving we're abiding in him and he in us. We need to know. Would you agree? And here it is. The commandments are really a commandment. Did you notice that? The commandments, plural, are actually a commandment. John continues. And this, afti, this afti, it's a demonstrative pronoun for emphasis. It's just like he's looking scanning all the different faith groups that are purporting to speak directly for God with all of their rules, rites, and rituals, feasts, fasts, and festivals. He's scanning that, and he finds the truth hidden in a little dark corner amidst all this klutz and clamor. And this is his commandment, singular in order that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and should be loving one another, even as he gave us commandment. Isn't that something? The two commandments, according to John, are actually one. It's just like that cross on the back wall. It's one cross, right? But it's two beams. The vertical, Jesus is our Lord. The horizontal, since he is our Lord, we have his nature, and he motivates us to share his life and love with people round about us. What a way to live. Doesn't that beat the alternative? 
This is beautifully, beautifully, beautifully precise, beloved. Think about this. In the Old Covenant, you had about 610 laws in the Torah, in the Old Testament. And in addition... The scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the ones that don't want anybody else to see, had added a bunch of other rules, rites, and rituals on top of that. Till the average Jewish person who was really trying to do the right thing and keep God's commandments so he could be in relationship was about like about half backslid, you know, with this. Yeah. And sadly, Christians are still that way today. Some churches, they'll tell you what to eat, when to eat it. They'll tell you how to dress. They tell you what days you must worship on or you've received the mark of the beast. It's absolutely outstanding what can happen when man gets a hold of God's word and twists it and tries to make it say what he wants it to say so he can gain at your expense. Sad, isn't it? How many are glad we have this book? This is the fellow that laid his head on the breast of Jesus at the Last Supper following the Passover meal. He heard it directly from the voice of God in the flesh. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I've loved you. None of us can do that perfectly, but we've got something to aim for, don't we? Yeah. What a beautiful life. What a beautiful life. Beautifully precise. Now listen to me. This is his commandment in order that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. Everybody say believe. John was a partially educated fisherman. He certainly knew the language of the day. He would have been fluent in his Hebrew vernacular, Aramaic, being the man of God that he was and living where he had been brought up. He was also fluent in the lingua franca in the English of the day, Kini Greek. And so John was able to tell us clearly what's it mean to believe in the Son of God. He uses a word that means at a point in time. A point in time. Have you ever asked somebody if they considered being a believer or if they were a Christian? And gotten this response. (laughs) Well, shucks, I'm trying to be. Have you ever heard that? That'd be like asking an Italian person, are you Italian? Well, (laughs) shucks, I think if I eat a little more pizza and a little more spaghetti, I'll get there. This is not a gradual thing, is it? No. According to John, one second before we're not Christians, one second after we make Jesus Lord, We're born from above, have a new nature, a new destination, a new king, a new Lord, a new law, a new life, a new power, a new motivation, a new goal, a new reason for getting up out of bed in the morning, a new family, a new army surrounding us constantly, warring angels and others, praise God, all of that in a point in time. The Bible says in John 1, 12, he, the master, came unto his own things, Israel, Jerusalem, Judaism, and his own people received him not. But to those who received him, to them he gave the authority to become what? Sons of God. Has anybody here ever been handed a baby? Did it take you 15 hours to receive the baby? Just kind of out of nastiness. <laughs> when my little boy was a baby, Barb brought him to the state radio station I worked at, and my boss, not my manager, but the man who owned all the stations, happened to be visiting. And he's, Joe, how are you? I said, I'm good, Jack. How are you? Fine, fine. Is he going to be here long? No, I've just got a couple meetings. I said, Jack, I said, you need to meet my baby boy. And I took him from Barb and put him right in his arms. Oh, thank you. He's cute, isn't he, Jenna? Take this. <laughs> he, it was instant. He wasn't there for 13 hours trying to get a grip. He took, took him to himself. That's the new birth. Any of you mothers like to have a baby gradually? What came before was enough, right? I think Barb went through about 
about 12 hours. She was about half backslid, and I just got there. I mean, I just got there and whisked me into the room. I, I won't go through the story, but I had to leave the radio station. Someone had to come in and relieve me, and, and I would have been off the air, and I couldn't do that. I had to drive about 40 minutes, and I, I still made it. And uh, that was the end of it, and she still wasn't singing the national anthem, you know. But when the birth happened, it happened like that. I'm watching, I'm waiting. And we had to figure it was probably a girl. She hadn't gained a whole lot of weight. Probably a little girl. Didn't know for sure. Didn't have the ultrasound or whatever. I'm waiting. And suddenly, he makes his appearance. And I hear the doctor, I hear the doctor say, this is a little boy. That was Christmas plus Christmas plus New Year's. Wow, like double, triple wow. I said, oh, man, a football player. With those fingers, I'm going to say piano player. I don't care what, as long as they were all there. It happened like that. How many are tracking with me? You don't have a baby, a birth, gradually. There's an, a moment when the baby comes. There's a moment when we become believers. There are people I'm talking to all over the world that don't know this. They're still stuck in this idea of Christianity being a religion, a gradual deal. Uh, God maybe said goodbye to your past sins, but you're on, you're on probation now. It, it, what a horrible way to live. It's not about life. It's not about a relationship uh, to him, right, that takes place in a miracle moment. Solomon bought me this uh, ancestry kit thing or whatever it is when they get your DNA years ago. And every once in a while, not often, every once in a while, they'll give me updates. We found out a little bit more. How many have ever had that? It's kind of interesting. And, and some new stuff came in. The very latest, and I think this might be the real deal. I'm, I'm like a third Italian, a third Greek, and a third Eastern European. How did I get that way? How did I get Eastern European? By a lot, just the more drunk vodka you get, the more Eastern. No. How did I get to be Italian? Just overdue on pastas? How, how did I become one-third Greek? How, how does that happen? Baklava, baklava, baklava. Good stuff. Good stuff. i tell you what's even better. Something called ouzo. That is a Greek liqueur. If you have a tummy ache, take some ouzo. That, that preacher actually mentioned booze. I said a little ouzo might help you, but ask your doctor first. But think about this. You don't become Greek or Italian or, or Eastern European by what you do or by what you eat or by what you drink. It's your DNA. You ever wonder why you're such a mixed up mess? I've been wondering my whole life. I'm finally getting it. DNA. DNA. Do you know what's responsible for artery trouble? About 50% of it is genetics. Thanks, Dad. That's what you can find out. Yeah, about half of the reason people have this challenge is genetics. Did you have any control over who your dad or your mom were? Is this helping anybody? Gosh, I stopped here a while, but Jeff, I'm going to do it. You have faith? Just wave. Yes, he does. I know him for a couple of weeks. That's point in time, right? Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, If you confess with your mouth, Jesus, Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved because with the heart man believes unto righteousness like that. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. I'll throw this. Would you like a freebie this morning? What's he on? What happened to this guy? I got nine hours of sleep. Here's a freebie. I'm dangerous. You don't want to get near me if I've had ten. Uh, here's a freebie. In Bible days... The word Kyrios, Lord, meant that, a Lord, a master. But for a Jewish person who was bilingual, and most were, who, who also knew Greek, they, they remember that in the Old Covenant, when the Jewish translators brought the word Yahweh over into Greek, they didn't use that word, Yahweh, in the Old Covenant. They used another word, Adonai, Lord, because they were afraid of using the, co the uh, covenant name. And they would use, when they brought it into Greek, they used the word Kyrios in the place of Yahweh. So not only is a believer saying when they're born from above, you are now my Lord, I'm your servant, which is true. They were also saying, I believe that Jesus, Jesus, is Yahweh. 
Jesus is God in the flesh. Do you see why conversion and Christianity and salvation is all about a person? It's, a, it's not about what we do. It's about whose we are. Jesus is God in the flesh. A believing Jew who was bilingual knew when he said Jesus is Kyrios. He knew what he was saying. He's God in the flesh. And it happens at a point in time. The first, this point in time experience, makes possible the second. The lifestyle of loving others like the Lord has loved us. It's cause and effect. It's being followed by doing. And it's not the reverse. Jesus described this beautifully to the Samaritan woman at the well. Whoever takes one drink of the water that I, I will give him, will never thirst again forever. That's pretty strong, isn't it? One drink, that's the new birth. One drink of the water that I give him will never thirst again. Oop me, double negative, will never thirst again forever. Why, Jesus? Because the water that I give him will become in him. That's the second experience. Will become in him a well of water gushing up into everlasting life. That is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. What a beautiful picture. What a beautiful picture. And that changes your life. How many believe it? I was at McDonald's the other day. And I'm behind this lady who had a little boy with her. And I'm waiting to order. And she turns around, smile like she just swallowed the sun. Total stranger. Oh, don't worry, sir. They're busy. They, they're, they're behind. I said, oh, that's no problem. I, I've been here before. Just wanted you to know. It'll, it'll be okay. And I thought, I haven't even had breakfast, and my day's complete. I mean, it's like someone grabbed her by the ankles and dipped her in a big bowl of kindness. And I knew it immediately she was a believer. I knew it. How many of you can tell a believer? Usually a mile away. You can normally, if you're, you know, halfway awake, you can see eternal life in someone else's eyes. Some people have it and some don't. Well, it ought to be that way. If you're residing in God and God is residing in you, <laughs> something ought to be happening. So I go to my seat and another lady comes over with my tray. And I thought, wow. And I'm looking around and my angels here, what's happening? Here, I didn't, you didn't have to go up there and wait. And brings my tray. I thought, man, alive. And I'm so glad my doctor was not there because he would have done this. Don't ask me what I had, because he may watch this. <laughs> he won't like it. But anyway, there I was, and I, I'm just fixing it. I had a little Kindle there. I was just setting things up. And this same lady comes by, stops. They didn't give you any napkins. I said, well, I declare, and I never noticed that. Here, they gave me too many. <laughs> there. I hope you enjoy your breakfast. I said, you do the same. Look after yourself. She said, I will. Nice boy. Just, she was glowing Christianity. Guess what else was at McDonald's? A meeting of a cult. Five or six around the table, cult members. And it was like they were broadcasting icicles. It was cold. It was lifeless. It was dead. That one woman with eternal life lit up my whole morning. It makes a difference, doesn't it? How does this work up and work out in our daily lives? Here we are, down, up, and out. Let's breeze through it. I believe I can do it. I believe I can do it. Here's another emphasis. By this, everybody say this. By this, demonstrative pronoun for emphasis, tuto, by this and nothing else, we are knowing by experience that he is residing in us. How's that, John? By means of the spirit which he has given to us. Just as John is emphatic about how we know that we are his New Testament people and we know what the commandments are to believe and to love as Jesus loved. We know how uh, he abides in us because he has given us the Holy Spirit in power. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Whoever believes in him will have everlasting life, right? That is the new birth. That's God's gift to the world. Luke 13 I'm sorry, Luke 11, verse 13. If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly 
Father, give the Holy Spirit to the ones that are asking him. That is the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the Father's gift to the church. Jesus was emphatic when he said, I'm going to send you another comforter just like me, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world does not possess the ability to receive because they do not know him, but you know him because he's in you, the new birth, and shall be filling you to overflowing. And that's exactly what happened on the day of Pentecost. Think about this. The presence of the Spirit of God in power down from above identified him as the Messiah. How many remember that? John 1.23, right? His second cousin, John the baptizer, said to those listening to him, the one who told me and called me to baptize in water, God, said the one on whom you see the Spirit come and rest, that's the one that baptizes in the Holy Spirit. That's the one who is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. How did he know? Because of the evidence of the Spirit of God upon Jesus, John 1.33. And he's the one that confirms you and me and everyone else as a believer. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22. God is the one who puts us together with other believers, who affirms and certifies and authenticates us by anointing us by his Holy Spirit and giving us the Holy Spirit as our earnest. What is that, Pastor? Glad you asked. Even today in modern Greek, that word earnest is arodona, and that's an that's a, uh, engagement ring. Now, when you're, you're thinking about asking a girl out, and she picks up her handbag, and you see a nice, big, juicy engagement ring, if you have any sense at all, especially when you see her betrothed and he's about twice your size and eats nails for breakfast, what, what do you normally do? Why? That outward sign tells you whose she is. When people look at us as we're spirit-filled, they know there's something different about us because we've got the engagement ring. How many are glad? The blessed Holy Spirit, the one who makes us new initially, came how? Down from above, Acts 2.3. And there came, there appeared to them, I should say, tongues as of fire distributing and sat upon each one of them. Beloved, the picture is there was a sound of a rushing mighty wind. That sound filled the place where they were sitting. And there came a ball of fire a ball of fire dividing itself. The Spirit of the Lord divided himself into tongues of fire that sat where? It be upon every one of the 120. He came down from above. When Jesus came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord came how? Down from above and set him apart. When Peter preached, and the Spirit of God came on the household of Cornelius. What happened? He came down from above. He fell on them. When Paul laid hands on the Ephesians in Acts 19, the Bible says the Holy Spirit came upon them, down from above. This is followed by what? His coming up from below. What did Jesus say? The water that I will give him shall become in him a spring of water gushing up into everlasting life. That's like a fire hose was just turned on. Boom! There it is. When you and I are baptized in the Holy Ghost, it comes up from below. Jesus said, he that believes on me out of his innermost being will what? Gush rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, who they, them that believed on him were about to receive. But the Spirit was not yet, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. But when he was, the Spirit of the Lord came upon, and then he came up from below. Where did he come from, beloved? What part of the body? Belly. Belly. You know what that word is in the text? Kilia. You women, you're blessed. It's also used of womb. What's in a womb? Life. What happens in a womb? It's the source of birth. Think about this. The Spirit of God comes to be on the inside of us. It's a place where we can birth ideas, birth ministry, birth 
encouragement. It's from down here, up from below, the word of wisdom that helps somebody, the word of knowledge, discerning of spirits, other languages, interpretation of those languages, gifts of healings, the gift of the working of miracles, special faith. Revelations come from that. All that's birthed down here. I was praying the other day, and down here came up this picture, the front picture, the front page of a new book that doesn't exist yet. We had a visitor come in Wednesday night, bless her heart. She got here about half, halfway into the service, but she was glad to, to get here and uh, never saw her before. And she came to the front, and we, we were closing. I said, anybody need prayer? She said, I do. And she came over here, and I anointed her. I said, do you mind if I anoint you with oil? Oh, no, no. I anointed her with oil. I prayed for her a little bit. and in, uh, She didn't hear me. I was undertoned. I prayed a little bit for her in Greek and something else I said. And then I, I began to talk to her. And I said, the Lord's going to do such and such, and you're concerned about such and such. Is any of this making sense? And she almost, her head almost fell off. She was nodding vigorously, crying. And she came out of it, prayed, came out of it, and we, we kind of helped her get to the door and showed her around a little bit. And you know what? She left with an armful of books. I said, come back anytime. She said, I appreciate this. Wow, I was just trying to find a church on a Wednesday night. I didn't know I was going to get all this. <laughs> well, we didn't either, darling, but we're glad you did. The third dimension, hopefully, is out from within. That's what happens Wednesday night. That's what happen, happens when you go to a, a McDonald's and God puts somebody on your heart. You give him some of your napkins, Right? You encourage him. You tell him, cheer up. They're a little behind. It'll be all right. And you look at a child, the best, the best raised child you've seen in a month of Sundays. Now, now you, you carry mother's stuff back there. You take that tray. Yes, mother. Wow. I've been transported to leave it to Beaver. I, I, I'm, waiting for, I'm, I'm waiting for the old man to come in. You know. Now, Beaver, I've told you. But, uh, you know, he was a minister. He was a minister, yep. He just would fill in, you know. And then he'd make film noir pictures where he's a detective. I thought, boy, that dude lived my life. <laughs> Can only happen once, I guess. But he's, in, he's on the other side in heaven. But in a perfect world, this is the last step. The spirit, like a moving stream, comes out from within. So down from above, up from below, and then out from within. Why, Pastor? Because people are desperately in need of love and concern and care. And by your conduct and character and mine, we have the personality and power of the triune God on the inside of us through things that we say and things that we do. And we can change things for people who desperately need things changed. How many believe that's good news for God's people? I think it's a wonderful way to live. And it's as real as that pew you're sitting on. God being my helper, I'll be able to go to a little restaurant Jeff and I go to, sometimes with Solomon. We've been doing it for years and years and years. We have kind of a meeting. It's sort of a regular thing. And one of the waitresses that normally waits on us is still different toward us since we first offered her some books, since I first shook hands with her and prayed for her, and she found herself healed of something. Having a bad Sunday, she just came while we're eating and said, would you tell me some things that happened on the mission field? I feel like terrible today. I need some good news. And I just talked about some miracles and we just watch her cry. People need to be encouraged. They need to see you. They need to see me. They need to see somebody whose citizenship is not of this earth, who comes from a higher place, who came from God, is, who's here to know God, and make him known, who's going back to the God he came from. People need desperately, right? So let's remember this this morning. Let's remember this. We've got one commandment, to believe and to love. And we know we're the real deal because he has given us of his spirit. He came down from above and then up from within and hopefully down from below and hopefully out from within. Father, thanks today for this divine appointment we have with you whenever you call us home. We are so happy to be your called, chosen, elect. We don't understand why, but you do, and we accept it. We thank you that when we heard, we RSVP'd, 
Everybody around us, it was like, it was like yesterday's newspaper. Nobody got anything out of it. But when we heard the gospel, a light came on. We know your voice because we're your sheep. And because we're your sheep, Lord, you said you would give your sheep eternal life and they would never perish. We thank you. In some way, we'll never understand until we see you face to face. We have been your sheep from eternity past. Because of that, you gave us eternal life and will never perish. It's God's will that of all he has given you, you will lose not even one. We thank you that the body of Christ is going to be complete with no, no member missing because of our great God, our wonderful Savior, and our precious, faithful Holy Spirit. We ask a blessing, Master, on people around the tri-state, across this country, and all over the world who pray, who attend, who support, and serve through our fellowship and through this international ministry. We thank you for lives that are being changed, churches that are being birthed, ministries that are being renewed, sometimes saved from destruction. We thank you for all you're allowing us to be, do, and have as your representatives. We pray a blessing on everyone connected with us that what they send out is going to come back blessed by you in a harvest where they need it most, hopefully a thousand times as much or more. Bless us as we come around your table, Lord. We give you the thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're giving today, that's great. If you're wanting to receive the Lord's Supper, we do not practice closed communion like many churches do. You don't have to be a member here. If Jesus is Lord of your life, that's the only requirement. We follow the advice of Paul, let a man examine himself. Then let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Give me a couple of prayer points, yes. Christina. Mm -hmm. And um, I went home and I, I placed them in the middle. Where you go? Yeah. And, and I talked to her about it. And um, and then we had an appointment with her psychologist. And I um, stressed to her psychologist my feelings sure. like I did with yeah. you. Yeah. And um, she said, well, and she's a, a new person for Christina, mm -hmm. since Christina has been with since the surgery, and, since the surgery. Yeah. and so she was um, going through her going back, in, Christina's been on the same medicine sure. throughout this time, yep. and so she says, well let's just look at all of this medication that Christina's on and it turns out Christina's been taking way too much medicine more Wait. medicine than she should Hallelujah. and they're the, that's why that's oh my gosh. She, this, that's why they're thinking, hey, this is why she's so zombie-like all the time. No no expression, no... Right. Not no, just because of the frontal lobe thing. Nothing. And, wow. Um, so, we did, um, they changed her medication, and it's been a week. Yeah, right. And I Two did weeks, see yeah. Christina smile a few times. <laughs> <laughs> it's been, um, actually, that's some energy. She stays cleaning, cleaning. And then she, this weekend she's with her friend, and she, she asked her friend if maybe she could go with her to volunteer like she used to. Right. So that's what she's doing this weekend. My God. But I just wanted to let you know, and I think it's just going to improve. And I was, Praise I was God. That maybe that opened up the. Awesome. Yeah, her daughter had a uh, surgery regarding, related to the frontal lobe, which is the seat of personality. So that's the first place you look if something's changed. But over medication, big doors swing on little hinges, don't they? Sometimes all you need is a word that you haven't heard before. Thank God for the doctor who ever caught this. Yeah, that's amazing. I can't believe she's taking double this when she should have been. How and, about that? And so, yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah, praise God. God knows how to get her done. Let's look for better and better days for Christina. Amen. God bless doctors, but it's not a perfect system. Anything, anything else is either.
Praise God. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in memory of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after the supper. When he had given thanks, 
he gave it to them and said, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in memory of me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. If you need prayer today, we're always glad to join our faith with yours. Still have some copies of those new books out there. We have to get some more of Solomon's, but free, free PDF downloads on our website, also through Amazon Kindle and paperback. We'll try to get some more in here real soon. Yeah, and Solomon's preaching next week. I'll be here, but he's going to He's going to preach the word next week. I'll just, I'll just mess around, and I'll, I'll do, I'll do the, I'll do the Lord's supper next week for sure. Hallelujah! God's good. Amen. Amen. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Praise the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Our eyes are on you, Master. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father. The fellowship and the communion and ministry of the Holy Spirit be with us now and always. Amen. Amen. Don't let that be a stumbling block, what's on that table out there. Missy brought some sweet stuff. Please take some with you. There's coffee out there, tea, you name it, we have it. 